Good morning. Uh, I'm Andrea Buttrick. I use she, her pronouns. Thank you very much, Creative Mornings, for inviting me into the speaker series. Thank you also to Playground for hosting with a closed bar. <laughs> Thank you much. I'm glad you're all here. Thank you very much. If we're going to talk about abundance as a practice of social justice, we really need to start with all the ways in which we all learn. The materials that greeted you at that front table are there for you to engage while, while I speak and you listen. We know that when your whole body is engaged, you hear and learn and process differently. When your hands are engaged, when you're taking materials apart, you can literally take apart old ideas and previous biases. When you're constructing and creating something new, you can create new ideas and new pathways. And when we do that together in a shared space with a common vision, we magnify what we're capable of as a community. So if you haven't chosen a material and you would like to, please do. Feel free to get up while I'm speaking if you need to move or want to move. Uh, create, create nothing. Take things apart, take it with you, leave it behind as a trace of our time this morning. What I want to do this morning is consider what it means to shift from thinking with deficit to practicing abundance. And I want to do that first by considering a renewed image of the desert, and there sh then share some examples from my own practice, including my time as an early childhood educator, my time at Food Conspiracy Co-op, and as a community organizer. And then I want to end by considering what we can do for our community when we choose to see each other and ourselves through a renewed lens of abundance. Ironically, I want to start first by considering the desert. It seems an odd place to start a conversation about abundance. Deserts, we have been told, are metaphors for lack, are barren, are places we are lost, places we experience being lost in the wilderness. But we who live in the Sonoran Desert know better. We know that our desert is an experience of abundance. We know on this land that is Tohono O'odham and Yoeme people, their ancestral heritage, this is the place where we experience the intricately designed flora and fauna who know when to anticipate more growth and to live with less when it's necessary. And we know that the absolute most important celebration of the year is the monsoons. And we who live in the desert are prepared for that. Holding up this renewed image of the desert, particularly as we juxtapose it to a desert that we've been told is deficit, is empty, it starts to offer a possibility for thinking differently when we challenge that conventional thinking. Particularly that's important when we include that ancestral caretaking of our Tohono O'odham and Yoemi uh, peoples, because it becomes an early example of how, when we think with abundance, we can start to choose to advocate for communities that are more socially just. So hold that renewed image of the desert in your minds for a moment, and I want to offer some examples from my time as an early childhood educator. One of the images that drove my uh, thinking and preparing a lot was the illustrations of Bird Baylor, or of Peter Parnell in Bird Baylor's books. Bird Baylor wrote prolifically about the desert. She also wrote specifically for children. It's really clear that she sees children as capable and competent and deserving of being integrated into the desert where they live and learn. And it's clear from Peter Parnell's illustrations that he also experiences the desert as an abundant place. Post-World War II, in a small town in Italy called Reggio Emilia, experiencing the devastations from war, the uh, villagers spent their free time when they had free time gathering bricks from bombed out buildings, washing them, stacking them, and then with the support of folks from surrounding villages, began to rebuild. They did not, however, rebuild their city centers or their retail spaces. They chose, I love that I'm seeing nods, they chose to rebuild around their youngest citizens. They chose to build centers for learning for young children. Consider what that means for a city that has experienced devastation from war to choose to rebuild around their youngest citizens. Consider what it implies about what they believe about children's rights, children's engagement as full citizens, and the possibilities and capabilities of children. 
From that early experience, or that experience in, in Reggio Emilia, grew an educational philosophy we call the Reggio Emilia approach to early education. It's world renowned at this point, and it begins with a renewed image of children. Children seen as capable and competent, children as natural researchers and uh, forming of connections. When we teach with children, we consider environments intentionally, beautiful and engaging. We offer materials, just like the ones that are in your hand, as ways to literally construct creative learning with children. And we commit as educators to work in collaboration constructing edu children's education with and alongside them. In addition to that very powerful first pillar of the competent child, that renewed image, we are guided very much by the early words of Loris Malaguzzi, one of the original founders. Nothing without joy. My experience as an early childhood educator was one of being able to nurture democratic communities of children who drove their own education, who cared for and advocated for each other, who were inquisitive, capable, curious, compassionate, empathetic, creative, if I haven't said that, and joyful. It was a pretty amazing way to engage with children in an early childhood environment. When we teach this way with children, we are challenging conventional thoughts driven by a capitalist oppressionist structure that says that children are a part of building a new workforce. What can we extract? What can we take? What can we use? When you consider children through this renewed image, suddenly we're driven to advocate for children as full citizens, capable and competent worthy today, and deserving of caring for our communities when they grow older. So let's take a moment to sort of see the thread we have built so far. Practicing abundance as an act of social justice means starting with a renewed image of the desert, of our children. It means committing to a lens of nothing without joy, all with abundance, and a commitment to learn and collaboration when we do these things, again, we are more and more inspired to, to be committed to advocating for socially just communities. Let me offer some of my experience from current practice at Food Conspiracy Co-op. Food Conspiracy Co-op is a full service grocery and cooperative on 4th Avenue here in Tucson, Arizona, and has been practicing on that spot for 51 years. In 1971, a group of friends engaged in a rally uh, protesting capitalization of food, commodification of food, prison systems that were unjust, a war system that was obviously unjust. They found some refuge from during that protest in a religious center on the U of A campus. And they came up with a scheme. After that, they gathered in the back parking lot of what is now Food Conspiracy Co-op and agreed to travel out in different directions, buy food in bulk from farmers and producers and ranchers, return to that back parking lot and exchange what they had gleaned. It became so popular that they moved inside, became so popular again, they ended up having to hire workers before that we'd been volunteer run, expanded into the next two bays, and 51 years later, we are 4,000 owners strong, give or take several thousand because of record keeping, all of whom have a financial investment in the co-op, a democratic vote and voice. We have 44-ish staff, and we have a democratically elective board that serves as the voice for all of those owners. I mean, I, I should ask, since my boss is in the audience, how many co-op owners and or shoppers will make it as wide as possible? Nice. Welcome and thank you. So four years ago, we were finally able to say yes to that uh, question slash demand our owners and customers had been offering us for decades. An entrance into the back of our store, a more accessible store with better creativity and better flow. A few years of planning and we were ready to kick off our capital campaign in the summer of 2021. 
in the middle of pandemic. We were faced with a traumatized staff, a community filled with uncertainty, and a lot of voices, both real and in our heads, saying, this is not the right time. You can't do this. You can't ask people for money after they've lost so much. However, tasked with raising that money, oh, tasked with raising that $1.5 million of money, I looked to our history, I looked to our story, and I looked to our current practice. But ultimately, I found my answer written on a chalkboard at the front of the, co of the store that a staff member had written at the beginning of pandemic in March of 2020. We have enough. Food Conspiracy Co-op feeds community, not fear. So that's what I messaged. In the middle of pandemic, at a time when everybody was stressed and worried, with a history of 51 years behind us as a food cooperative, and responding to a request from owners to have a store that could serve as better stewards to our community, I messaged, Food Conspiracy Co-op is the experience of shared abundance when resources flow with a common vision. Four months later, we'd raised $1.5 million. So there are two points embedded in that statement that are really worth drawing attention to, shared and common vision. Shared abundance is what offers us the, uh, the challenge to the capitalist systems that say that acquisition should be for me, that acquisition is mine. Instead, we don't, one person doesn't have to bring it all, rather we each bring what we can uh, and the abundance becomes a shared experience. The second is that common vision. Common vision is what magnifies those shared resources. When seen through a common vision, gathered resources suddenly become deeper, richer, more sustainable, and more powerful. And it really is what drives not only the cooperative model, but what we should be considering when we want to challenge oppressionist systems of capitalism and extractionism that the shared abundance uh, through a common vision is the way to practice social justice. And so just like that war-stricken uh, town of Reggio Emilia, Italy, who it appeared was experiencing lack of both resources and energy, offered a common vision of a center for young children and their image of young children, was able to rebuild from that point. And just like Food Conspiracy Co-op, who started with a commitment to shared abundance right from the start in 71, and again in 2021, um, both of those things began with that shared abundance and that common vision. Two years ago, several years ago, forgive me, several years ago, we had two members of our community who were experiencing um, wellness crises, health crises. We wanted to step up and support them, one of them had given a tremendous amount to our community with, with music and love and a jovial spirit. The other had nurtured very intentionally communal spaces for our creative growth, made some really incredible beer, and had really committed a lot to the Tucson community. But we were musicians and we were artists and we felt like we didn't have any extra. But thinking back to my time as an early childhood educator with the Reggio experience, Thinking about my current time at Food Conspiracy Co-op, I went ahead and I asked. I asked bands who already had gigs booked if they'd be willing to donate their payout. Because gigs we mostly have plenty of, and fans we could always use more of, but I figured it was a good place to start. And just as you would expect, when the story is the right story, suddenly I was inundated with um, offers for, um, for art shows, offers for benefit concerts, Don Guerra from Barrio Bread designed music-inspired loaves of bread, brought them to one of the gigs, and sold them for a donation. Many of them sold for upwards of $50. Before long, we had several thousand dollars to offer back to our two members of our community struggling with health, health crises, and there it was, the experience of shared abundance when resources flow through a common vision. Practicing this way really is what undercuts the capitalist and extractionist systems of oppression. No longer do we look to the higher government echelons to, to meet our needs. 
our community will meet our needs, our social structures will meet our needs, our local businesses can do that. We have enough. However, I want to address a couple of sticking points. Manifest thinking and romanticizing poverty. Manifest thinking is really a tool used to distract us from systems that are intentionally put into place to keep us thinking in deficit, to keep us thinking that the responsibility for our deficit is our own, and to distract us from the fact that those, in those systems are intentionally there. It's disguised as optimism, it's disguised as hope, it's neither one of those, nor is it thinking with abundance. I also want to be very careful about romanticizing poverty. When we are washing bricks from, to rebuild buildings from a war our government started, when we are playing music to raise money to pay for medical bills that our government should be paying, we are not happy about our poverty. But we are saying we're not going to ask for anything more from you, and we're not going to accept that we're going to live with less. We have enough, and we will feed community and not fear. And so take a breath, because this is the place that we have been headed for. Practicing abundance is an act of social justice because it counters power structures intentionally designed to keep us focused on our deficit, thereby putting the power back into the hands of our communities. Practicing abundance as an act of social justice Thank you. means beginning with a renewed image based on abundance to inspire that revolutionary thought and practice. It's a commitment to practicing abundance, nothing without joy. We have enough. We can feed community, not fear. And it means working with our local communities driven by collaboration and cooperation. Resulting, resulting in those more socially just communities. And so I have one last offer for us. Consider what's possible in our communities if we choose to see ourselves and each other also through a renewed image. What is possible when we look at each other through that abundance lens? If we are willing to do that, to fully see each other in abundance, to welcome and include all voices, all bodies, all spirits in our communities and institutions. That is when we can really see what is possible to practice abundance as an act of social justice. And so we are, who are seeking to practice abundance as an act of social justice, let's begin with the image of our children. Let's move into an image of what's possible in our larger communities. Let's engage our creativity of our whole abundant selves and circling outward through our communities and into our deserts. May we leave here today newly committed to practice social justice, to practice abundance as an act of social justice. And thank you.